at the level of the argument in the text, a lot of the dialogues center around establishing definitions, exposing the fact that people don't really understand the essence of the things they're talking about, whether that is love or justice or whatnot. And in order to get to a true definition, you do have to tie into a deeper ontology. And the way to access that is through the uh, inscription, the oracle at Delphi, know thyself. And that's really the central theme of this dialogue. We're moving with Alcibiades from the natural and habituated virtues, what you have by birth and what you receive from your upbringing into the philosophical virtues where you start to look within and find those logoi or reason principles that reflect the inherent logoi reason principles of nature. Um, and of course, because we have all of us, those logoi built into our own, our own soul from before our births, we often have the pretense that we know something when really we only have it in the mode of being. It is there in our being, but it's not actually been brought into explicit knowledge. Um, so Socrates likes to expose that for people uh, because moving from the twofold ignorance to simple ignorance is still, even if you don't have true knowledge, is still progress. And currently at the beginning of the dialogue here, Alcibiades is in twofold ignorance because he thinks he knows, he thinks he can go and advise the Athenians um, on matters of war and peace and whatnot, uh, when in fact he does not. So uh, there are other benefits of this as an introductory text. The explanation is kind of given for the why the Mayudic method or the Socratic method of questioning. It's called Mayudic after the goddess Maya of midwifery. And Socrates claims to know throughout the dialogues three things, love, uh, dialectics, and midwifery. So the reason for the Mayudic method is that you will be better convinced and you will know more if you are the one discovering something for yourself and saying it for yourself. Um, and there are several moments in other dialogues when you get into a question and answer and the person is exposed not to know some core definition, a core concept in what they're talking about, like Thrasymachus in advantage or justice, and they get fed up and they say, well, you go ahead. Um, but you know, Socrates wants to keep that dialogue going so that the motion can be uh, an, a reverting motion of the individual towards their own soul where they can actually gain that true knowledge because knowledge imprinted from without is inferior to this knowledge that you discover from within yourself. And that dichotomy is drawn in the Alcibiades pretty early on. Okay, um, other comments, anybody else? Is this a good time to talk about uh, any controversy regarding whether Plato is the author of this dialogue or not? Yeah, sure. If you have anything to say on that. Yeah, just in the introduction uh, to to my text and the, the Cooper uh, complete works, it mentions that uh, it was just taken for granted to be by, Soc or by Plato up until the 19th century. Uh, so any controversy is pretty recent. Um, and really the only claim against it being by Plato is that, that this dialogue is too simple and straightforward. Uh, but that to me seems like a pretty uh, weak argument that, that it would not be by Plato. Right, I discussed this uh, with Dominic in my one-on-one -on -one with him for this week. Um, you know, I, I actually kind of could buy the idea that it was composed by a student of Plato, but a high quality student who really understood the philosophy because, you know, the reason they used it, the Neoplatonists did as an introductory text for Plato is that it contains seminally so many of the Platonic themes. And it's, you know, as if it was designed as an introductory text and spells out some things that remain implicit in all of the other Platonic works. Um, so, you know, either this is something that Plato wrote towards the end of his career, people wanted an easier introduction to his system of thinking, and so he uh, 
you know, made the concession of writing this dialogue or perhaps a student did write it. But in any case, I don't see anything in it that contradicts Platonic doctrine. Uh, so ultimately, I'm, I can remain agnostic on the question. It's, uh, it has the humor that you often find in Plato. It has some of this uh, appropriate setting, as in there are metaphorical uh, meanings to be taken from the relationships of the characters to one another. Um, the dialogues are supposed to be organic holes, and there, so there are many different facets of them that you have to look at to see the kind of total meaning. There is the style of the text, you know, is it more prosaic? Is it investigative? Uh, there are times when Socrates even slips into kind of dogmatic uh, pronouncing of, of things that he takes on the authority of uh, say, you know, the Egyptian priests, the story of Atlantis that he says he really believes, uh, stories that he doesn't give the source on, but then he just kind of teaches in a, a more didactic vein. There's also mythic sections where Socrates draws a myth to illustrate a point. Um, and these different styles are appropriate to different types of uh, themes or different subjects. So the content precedes the style and the style is always suited to the content. Uh, a hint would be if you see a lot of back and forth question answer, then we are in a kind of investigative section of the dialogue. If you see myths, uh, very likely the theme is going to involve theology at some level. Um, so here, uh, this is in one sense kind of uh, a romantic uh, dialogue, the relationship between the characters is similar to the kind of um, introductory texts from the Phaedrus, these odes to the, to the lover or to the non-lover and the advantages of them. So there's something of that character, which is more like the rhetorical side of it. And there are a lot of points of rhetoric to be taken from Socrates, although he criticizes rhetoricians and sophists. He is kind of the master rhetorician and sophist himself in many cases. So there is that. And But then once we get a little bit deeper in the dialogue and you get constant back and forth, then, okay, we're, we're in a matter of uh, establishing definitions, engaged in investigation and that's where the real meat of this thing uh, is to be found um, and then at the metaphorical level you have to look at the the matter of the dialogue or the individual characters and their relationships to one another one thing one kind of metaphorical lens to interpret this through is given by Proclus um, the relationship of Socrates to Alcibiades mirrors the relationship of Socrates to his own daimon Right, so uh, the daimon is an important con concept in Platonism. Socrates mentions his daimon often, or his kind of presiding spirit. In Neoplatonism, the doctrine was elaborated that everyone has their presiding daimon, similar to the, the guardian angel. And spirits or daimons are one order of souls, superior to human souls, um, Heroes and daimons are different types of souls that are higher than human souls. They don't fail in their energies. Human souls sin. Uh, heroes and daimons, at least complete heroes and daimons, uh, don't sin. Within each order of souls, there is a ranking of superior to inferior. So there's a story, for example, of Plotinus where they uh, engaged in some theurgy and summoned his presiding daimon and it was uh, as if it was a god itself. So he had a very powerful daimon ruling over him. Um, Socrates, the character of his peculiar daimon is that it only ever tells him what not to do. And he, he hears it in, in literal terms. So Socrates experienced vocal hallucinations that warned him not to do certain things. And this comes up in other dialogues where, you know, he's about to, for example, in the, uh, what is this one? The one where it's the two characters that are engaged in like sophisms coming up with these ridiculous arguments. 
it was a, one of the funnier dialogues. Y- uh, Euthydemus? Yeah, that might have been it. Yeah, Euthydemus, where he's sitting in this um, section of the, the changing room of the gymnasium, and he's about to get up, but then his daimon tells him to stay there because these guys are about to come in, and he's about to have this little rhetorical exhibition with them uh, that is pretty amusing for everybody. So he stays, right? That's the character of uh, Socrates' daimon. It gives him... Uh, the ability to be at the right place in the time at the right time um you know alcibiades by the way is the character that comes in at the end of the symposium the dialogue on love it's a dinner party alcibiades comes in drunk at the end of the dinner um and says like once again socrates is here like laying in wait for me um always appearing wherever i am um, and that is characteristic of the daimon itself, always ever vigilantly exercising its providential care for the spirit uh, that it's responsible for. So Socrates is kind of taking up the role or desiring to take up the role of the guardian spirit for Alcibiades to some extent. And there are some more specific hints in the text at this and uh, the way in which Socrates makes his appearance to um, Alcibiades reflects this because Alcibiades is just about to approach Socrates after all this time to ask, you know, what exactly is it that you're after here? What do you what do you think is going to happen? I've rejected all these other suitors who I thought unworthy. And here you are not from a noble family, whatever. And this is kind of extrapolation. Alcibiades doesn't say this, but this is the likely thought process. And uh, you know, that is the way that divine attendance works, right? It is always attendant, is always there and always looking, but we don't receive the energies of divine beings until we turn ourselves towards them. And so just as Alcibiades is beginning to think about approaching Socrates, now Socrates' inner daimon tells him, you know, or doesn't, just refrains from stopping him finally. And the explanation that Proclus gives for why Socrates Daimon always tells him to refrain and never tells him what to do is that uh, Socrates by nature is very generous with his time and wants to help people and wants to get involved. uh, And if anything would err in excess in those regards. So his Daimon kind of has to keep him uh, reined back a little bit. Okay, so that's a little bit on the daimon. Um, So daimons are not gods. Love in the symposium is called a great spirit, so one of the chief daimons. Um, But then alternatively, love is taken in a higher sense, the kind of heavenly Aphrodite and the the earthly Aphrodite. There are two different uh, birth stories, uh, origin stories for that goddess. And so similarly in the symposium, there are two different sides of love. Uh, but in any case, uh, at, at some point, love is compared to a spirit. The daimons are spirits. Heroes uh, interpreted not in the sense of like Greek heroes like Odysseus and so forth, but the order of heroes may come up uh, in the commentators if you read them. And that is an order, I think, superior to the daimons. And an order of angels by the, the term angels is added in later Neoplatonism as well. Uh, we're going to try to stick mostly to Plato's text, but I do encourage everybody, to the extent possible, try to look into the common uh, commentaries because there's quite a lot there, and often more than um, you know meets the eye can be found. So, any any last comments uh, before we wrap up the kind of survey section here, and then we'll dive into the text itself. Should we just go over briefly, like who Alcibiades is? Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. You should read um, Plutarch's biography of Alcibiades. That's the most complete record, and I think there are anecdotes about him to be found elsewhere. But I read uh, Plutarch's biography, and he's definitely an interesting character. Does anybody know all of those details and would like to relate that and uh, kind of explain who he was? And I I haven't read the the Plutarch yet, but uh, I mean, if nobody else has anything, we could just briefly say that that Alcibiades uh, was a, a Athenian statesman um, and he kind of switched sides a lot in the Peloponnesian War and uh, went over to Sparta and then 
uh, went and, and served uh, Persia for a little while, and then came back and was a, an Athenian general until they uh, they chased him out of Athens again. Right, and uh, because of this, his uh, several disgraces and dishonorable acts, um, people blamed Socrates uh, for this. They also blamed Socrates for the behavior later in life of Critias, who was a member of the 30 tyrants, or for Carmides. There's a dialogue named after Carmides, um, who also associated with Socrates earlier in life and then became uh, associated with these tyrants. Alcibiades was a traitor, seemingly. Um, but if you read uh, Plutarch's biography, it does look like Alcibiades sort of ran into a lot of bad luck. And after all, um, the help that Socrates gave him did produce fruits later in life. Anyone who Alcibiades advised politically, any side or anyone he served as a general was benefited uh, immensely by his service. So when he was on the Athenian side, the Athenians would tend to win. When he was on the Spartan side, the Spartans would tend to win. When he served the Persians, the Persians had success. So he was definitely a competent general. Um, Plutarch gives an anecdote of uh, Alcibiades kind of testing out his dialectic with Pericles, who was the guardian of Alcibiades. Um, and yet, according to that anecdote, Alcibiades really internalized dialectical methods and probably knew more about just logical thinking, rational thinking as a result than other statesmen at that time. You know, Pericles is taken to be a great statesman by Socrates, partly because of his association with uh, Anaxagoras, uh, the pre-Socratic philosopher who first kind of introduced mind as a fundamental principle. Um, but in any case, yeah, uh, Alcibiades was a... Uh, was under the guardianship of Pericles because his father, Cleinias, had died uh, heroically in battle serving the Athenians. So let's just, uh, if there's nothing else, go into the dialogue. Okay, so um, I'm using Benjamin Jowett's translation here. It's probably not always gonna be the most technically correct or using the best terms to capture certain subtle ideas, um, like for example, in Olympiodorus and Proclus, particular words are, a lot is made of particular terms, like uh, daring when it comes to, you know, it's hard to uh, play the suitor for someone who rejects suitors, but anyway, I must dare. And that word dare, uh, as translated in my commentary from Olympiodorus, uh, he associates with this Pythagorean doctrine about the dyad. So he's interpreting it metaphysically based on this one word, and yet in my English translation of this dialogue, that same word doesn't appear. And so, you know, the different translations can m omit key details according to Neoplatonic commentators, um, but Jowett's uh, generally uh, fun to read and is stylistically pleasing to me, so. All right, I dare say that you may be surprised to find, O son of Cleinias, that I, who am your first lover, not having spoken to you for many years, when the rest of the world were wearying you with their attentions, am the last of your lovers who still speaks to you. Okay, already we have several points. One, uh, why don't we think about why does he call him O son of Cleinias? Why that mode of address? There are three main reasons. He wants to highlight Cleinias especially yeah by mentioning his famous heroic father he already puts alcibiades in a frame of mind of wanting to live up to the virtuous character of his father um, also this was a traditional mode of address uh, among pythagoreans you would call people by their father's name son of x um, and then last there is a kind of theological dimension where a reversion to one's originating cause is what one is affecting through this self-knowledge that the dialogue is ultimately aiming at. Through knowing thyself, you know the cause of yourself. And so this kind of evokes a return to 
the paternal order of gods. Um, that may be a stretch, but that's what Olympiodorus says. And I think Proclus too. Lastly, it's just, uh, you know, creating the bond of, uh, of kinship, evoking the bond of kinship, uh, which helps in his approach as a lover. And then who am your first lover still remain after all the others have been uh, shooed away. And that reflects the idea in Proclus, but I think this can be seen in the dialogues itself, including this one here, that the higher beings extend their influence to lower beings first before other beings and then uh, remain longer. This is clear when it comes to um, you know, the forms that we participate of in terms of which one is a higher level or higher order form. For example, the form uh, animal is higher than the form of man because every form of man, every man is already participating of the form of animal. So that higher level, you know, the world, the, the one living being is the animal, whereas the form of man is within that one living being, um, lower level being. So we receive the energies of higher beings first. So Socrates is the first lover of Alcibiades and he remains longer. So even after someone, for example, loses their humanity, their rational faculty, they still have their animal nature, their vital nature, and so forth with all the orders of being. So uh, the, the higher orders extend their influence further uh, attend prior to others and remain longer. Well, uh, I thought about uh, Proclus commentary about uh, the seven causes uh, and they treat Socrates as the instrument uh, of, of the divine in this instance uh, of the con conversation with Alcabiades. So yes, um, I believe it's six types of causes, not seven, unless I'm getting that wrong, Tomer. It's uh, the four Aristotelian causes plus uh, paradigmatic cause and instrumental cause for the six cause uh, six forms of causation recognized by Neoplatonists. Uh, so the four Aristotelian would be formal, which is not uh, you know like the influence of the forms. For, so, for example, we are caused in some sense by the form of man, but Aristotle's formal cause has more to do with the imminent form of our being here. Uh, form and matter being the composite that constitutes the individual. But in any case, you have formal cause, final cause, which is teleology, the purpose of actions. So why do I drink water? Because I, I desire to drink water. There's a teleological cause. It'd be hard to explain that simply in terms of efficient cause. And then there's efficient cause, which is like A bumps into B, B moves as a result. That, uh, you know, the things that directly set in motion other things. And then there is a material cause or that of which something is made. So a whole is dependent on its parts, is in some sense caused by its parts. And now the paradigmatic cause is closer to that influence of the transcendent form itself. Um, and this can be, you know, the example can be drawn between a material paradigm and an image that's made in its like likeness. So a model, you know, for sculpture is the paradigmatic cause of the sculpt, the uh, eventual sculpture that's produced. Um, it's the image or the, the archetype that the image then is molded after. Um, okay, and then instrumental cause is the instrument that is used by one thing um, to affect its, its goals. So Socrates is filling that role of the instrumental cause of the gods, right? He says a, you know, I'm being moved to talk to you because this God has allowed it. And then as he begins the discussion, I don't know if you guys caught this, but he, uh, says, suppose that at this moment, some God came to you and said, so already, um, pretty early on, we have an evocation of the divine and putting the words of the initial, this is the beginning of the argument itself uh, or, or something like that. Anyway, 
but uh, yeah, that's so he evokes the idea of the god because he is serving primarily as an instrument of the gods. All right. So the cause of my silence has been that I was hindered by a power more than human, of which I will someday explain to you the nature. Um, right. Hindered by a power more than human. He's talking about his daimon here. Um, this impediment has now been removed. And also rhetorically, uh, evoking some superhuman power that has been restraining him is quite a way of spinning, you know, I've been following you around but not talking. Uh, that's, you know, kind of a necessary uh, hook to get uh, Alcibiades' attention. And so the way that I'm pronouncing Alcibiades, by the way, is the standard English pronunciation. In Greek, it would be closer to Alcibiades, uh, something like that. But I'll say Alcibiades. Um, this impediment has now been removed. Right. Uh, and that's how Socrates knows what he should do. It's what he is not told not to do. I therefore here present myself to you, and I greatly hope that no similar hindrance will again occur. In the other translation, I think it said expect, basically, um, and that's judging from the character of Alcibiades and also judging from the fact that the divine doesn't do anything by accident. So it wouldn't at one, the divine is not capricious. It's slow to begin its effects um, it, here where it's noticeable. So I said before, higher causes exert their effects first, and that is true, but uh, in terms of like, good consequences of behavior, the rewards of the gods are slow to begin and then they're they're slow to fade away. That's another point that we'll see here. Um, meanwhile, I have observed that your pride has been too much for the pride of your admirers. They were numerous and high spirited, but they have all run away, overpowered by your superior force of character. Not one of them remains. And Socrates admires that because Alcibiades has one of the qualities of the divine lover, right? There's different kinds of love. There's divinely inspired love, and then there's base love. So uh, Alcibiades ex is exhibiting judgment and discernment. The other facet of divine love is going to be compassion. Alcibiades has not exhibited that as much, but he is ex exhibiting discernment you know, he doesn't accept the many who approach him and Socrates some, sees something admirable there. And I want you to understand the reason why you have been too much for them. You think that you have no need of them or of any other man, for you have great possessions and lack nothing, beginning with the body, ending with the soul. In the and this is, you think, and then he says in the character of Alcibiades, beginning with the body, ending with the soul. So he is at one level saying, you know, you have great possessions, you lack nothing, seemingly giving compliments, but he's also accusing, even in this first paragraph, which seems very like, you know, praising and flattering, uh, he's actually, and Olympiodorus goes into a lot of this, he is actually giving a kind of backhanded compliment where he's accusing, you think you have no need of any other man. And also you'll see in the instances, the explanation for why he feels that way, you have the most distinguished family, you have Pericles as your guardian, like uh, that is him having need of others. So even there he's, he's exposing like your thought process is full of contradictions and Socrates sees all of these contradictions already, um, but he's not highlighting them yet. In the first place, you, see to, uh, you say to yourself, that you are the fairest and tallest of the citizens. In this, everyone who has eyes may see to be true. And this, again, seeming flattery at one level, but also it's an attribute that is plain to everyone, which means it's common, which means it's not actually the kind of highest quality uh, thing that, that you should be focused on. Something that anybody, any old person can recognize and see um, is not something of true worth. In the second place, and anybody feel free to interrupt with their thoughts as we go here. In the second place, it, is yeah. this uh, this is reminding me of uh, that passage from Elements of Theology about like the the any uh, entity which is sufficient unto itself. Um, right. Yes. 
So Alcibiades has the pretension to be like a god, but then doesn't really understand that the reasons he has uh, for um, ha feeling that sense of superiority are actually contingent, are actually kind of base and common at a certain level. And we'll see, you know, more of that. Uh, Alcibiades recognizing his inadequacy later on. In the second place, uh, that you are among the noblest of them, highly connected both on the father's and the mother's side, sprung from one of the most distinguished families in your own state, which is the greatest in Hellas, and having many friends and kin kinsmen of the best sort. So these are all relational properties. None of these are truly self-sufficient properties. So he is pointing out a contradiction, uh, even if it's not clear at the beginning. Who can assist you when in need? But then on the other hand, that means Alcibiades would have obligations for them as well. And yet in his mode of thinking, he's only thinking about how others can help him. And there is one potent relative who is more to you than all the rest, Pericles, the son of Xanthippus, whom your father left guardian of you and of your brother, and who can do as he pleases not only in this city, but in all of Hellas and among many and mighty barbarian nations. Um, so Socrates is kind of trying to take the role of Pericles here and, you know, the characterization of Pericles, he can do as he pleases, is not indicative of a truly philosophical character. You know, Socrates doesn't believe that you should just do as you please. He's not saying Pericles knows what is right to do. He just says he has the ability to do what is great, right? Uh, Alcibiades is a person driven by the spirit He's a highly spirited person. Um, for those who weren't part of the last discussion group, there, are, you know, the tripartite soul goes from logos, reason, to thumos, uh, spirited emotion, courage, to epithumia or appetite. Ap appetite being more manifold, m pulling in different directions. Thumos being more unified, fighting against appetite ideally in the service of logos, reason, which is more unitive, which unites the character, you know, finds that one singular truth at the end of the day. And uh, so people ruled by thumos, ruled by spirited emotion, are uh, exceptional people. They are high quality people. In the different characters that Plato lays out in the Republic, um, a, uh, according to the different types of states, the timocratic, or spirited man is second in that hierarchy. So first is the aristocratic man, kind of ruled by philosopher king, society, and the aristocratic constitution is where the individual soul is regulated by its highest principle, logos. And then beneath that is the timocratic state and the timocratic man who is ruled by spirit and emotion, who wants fame, who wants you know, power, who wants to exert himself, so he characterizes Pericles uh, in accordance with this. He can do as he pleases in all of Hellas and among many and, by, many and mighty barbarian nations. Moreover, you are rich, but I must say that you value yourself least of all upon your possessions. So this is a virtue. He is untouched. He's not even close to being the oligarchic man, which is the third kind of state and the third rank of temperament or constitution of the soul. Uh, beneath that is the democratic man. An oligarchic man is superior to a democratic man because the oligarchic man at least has a proper ordering of his appetites. He's ruled by appetite, but he has the most prudent appetites, the, the ones that'll make him rich rather than the ones that'll be too indulgent. The democratic man is indifferent with his appetites, egalitarian in his appetites, and that leads to uh, you know, a kind of inferior position of the soul. And then Worst of all is the tyrant, the tyrannical state or the tyrannical man who is ruled by one overarching appetite, which is not prudence um, or not regulated by prudence, but is simply this kind of raw desire to acquire. You know, Eros is the predominating influence over him. And uh, yeah, in some way, the tyrant you can see is like the foil of the philosopher king. So uh, that's also true in the metaphysical hierarchy of Platonism. The one is simple in some sense, and the very bottom of the ontological hierarchy, matter, is simple. It doesn't have complex qualities. It's basic. 
right? So there, but it's simple in the way of having no power, whereas the simplicity of the one is overflowingly powerful, always emanating, constantly uh, reality. Matter is infertile, is not prolific, doesn't uh, progress or proceed any farther. Um, so there, there is a similarity, but it's a kind of inverted similarity. Okay. Um, so anyway, Alcibiades doesn't value possessions. And all these things, um, and if I bring too much in or that you're not following, don't worry, these themes come up constantly in all the dialogues. So if you are not familiar with some of these ideas yet, um, if you stick around, you will get familiar with them. And all these things have lifted you up. You have overcome your lovers and they have acknowledged that you were too much for them. Have you not remarked their absence? And now I know that you wonder why I, unlike the rest of them, have not gone away and what can, uh, and what can be my motive in remaining. So Socrates says he knows that you wonder why um, philosophy begins in wonder. So Socrates says that he knows the state of mind of Alcibiades and he knows that you're curious, you want to know uh, my state of mind. Socrates having a superior state of mind, Alcibiades wanting to know that state is a desire for return, reversion, you know, moving towards the paternal causal principles of reality. Closer to Socrates is the mediating force. The daimons or the presiding spirits are meant to mediate between us and higher beings to guide us back to those higher beings. And at each order of being, you know, the presiding spirit, the providential force should be proximate, right? You have intermediaries at all steps. And so a child doesn't deal directly with the president of the country, he deals with his father, right? The, the closest mediary. And Socrates, um, you know, is that suitable med mediary for Alcibiades. It also just kind of makes sense uh, sociologically if Socrates is patriotic for Athens, which you can see that he is in the Crito. Um, he values his children having Athenian citizenship more than he does having uh, them having him around in exile. Um, so he is patriotic and he sees this youth with great potential. He falls in love. He appreciates the, the beauty of soul in Alcibiades, even when he's a child, not because Socrates is uh, a pedophile or a pervert, but because he cares about Athens and the future of his state and wants to foster the youth and cultivate them. Um, and he sees that wonder that has been, uh, awakened in Alcibiades, which is the beginning of philosophy. It begins in wonder. Alcibiades, perhaps Socrates, you are not aware that I was just going to ask you the very same question. What do you want? And what is your motive in annoying me and always wherever I am making a point of coming? Um, so like the, the daimon, always in attendance. I do really wonder what you mean and should greatly like to know. Okay. Um, then if, as you say, you desire to know, I suppose that you will be willing to hear, and I may consider myself to be speaking to an auditor who will remain and will not run away. Um, Socrates likes doing this, getting the partner in conversation to agree to the terms of the conversation. Like, how should we have this discourse? That's rhetorically a very important step, because otherwise someone can engage in bad faith in discourse and try to slip out of you know, what is uh, trying to be elicited or awakened or recollected in the conversation. Um, and you can't really hold them to account because there were no terms, there were no explicit terms. So he tries to establish explicit terms here. Um, you'll remain and won't run away, certainly let me hear. Uh, you had better be careful for I may be uh, as unwilling to end as I have hitherto been to begin. So again, the effects, the energies of the gods uh, arrive first and per, uh, depart last of all energies. The higher uh, effects sooner, but the um, consequences, the rewards and punishments of divine beings um, is, are slow to begin and slow to withdraw. So, you know, for example, if you fall into a sinful lifestyle, you might not feel the consequences immediately. You can go for months and even years without really 
getting the consequences. And then once they begin, your life falls apart and you suffer for a long time because of your sin. Um, and then gradually you can kind of start climbing back up the hill. And the same with if you put in a lot of work, if you're there, you know, starting your business, putting in 12 hours a day, trying your best, um, then like it might not work out immediately. But when it does start to work out, then you can expect this kind of continuing uh, uh, benefit to accrue. Okay, I'm going to break here and just get... Um, any other thoughts on this first exchange, the relation of the characters? Anything um, at all? Can I comment on one thing? Sure. Um, so I was um, I was reading Olympiodorus, and I have this feeling that maybe Socrates is placing himself in between the divine and Asibiades, because I feel that when he says that his action was divinely inspired, it is like he was an instrument in the hands of the divine. And then also Olympiodorus, he makes this distinction between uh, the two different kinds of lovers, the crude lover, yes, and the divine inspired lover. So of course, um, the, the difference is he mentions, I think, three. So the first being that uh, the crude lover uh, is only about the body. And the divinely inspired lover is um, is present in a godlike way, so without necessarily being physically present. And then the divinely inspired lover, he stays until the end. And I think the most important thing is that the divine lover, he will never injure the beloved, because his like his presence is only benign. And um, Olympiodorus, he's, here he says. Um, that the divinely inspired lover uh, wants to bring about the good for his beloved by reverting his attention to fine and beautiful things. So I think it's like a guarantee that he's not, by, by doing, um, by, by proceeding with his method, he's only about to bring the good things. He's never about to injure anyone. Right, yeah, very well said. Um, so I would just elaborate the one point um, that you reminded me of here, which is that the divine lover exerts his influence from afar, just as the divine beings exert their influence while remaining exempt and in themselves. So things that move are inferior to things that remain unmoved. The divine lover is superior in so far as he is always present without having to kind of move himself towards the object of his love. Um, yeah, but those are those are very good points. Uh, as you say, Olympiodorus has a lot of good things to say. A lot of it is derived from Proclus, but um, Olympiodorus might be a little bit easier to read for, for some people. Um, he also has a nice biography in this um, Ancient Commentators on Aristotle series that uh, translated by Michael Griffin. There, It starts with, the lecture one is on the biography of Plato. But yeah, uh, the attributes of the divine lover are important to keep in mind here. Um, and this idea that he is only ever trying to bring about the benefit of the um, object of his love is intimated and suggested later in subtle ways in the text, where at one point, for example, I'm not going to try to find it just now, but Alcibiades says, you know, uh, well, proceed, I, I don't expect any harm will come of it and socrates says well you're quite the prophet and it looks like banter it looks like just joking around sort of um but the, that is kind of a, a hint so alcibiades seems to anticipate that like socrates knows more uh than i say i expect he he kind of at some level knows that socrates is his, his superior even here perhaps socrates you are not aware that i was just going to ask you uh, he's not confident enough to say like, well, you didn't realize I was just about to, he kind of ex admits the possibility that maybe uh, Socrates does know that I was just about to approach him and that's why he's talking to me now. Um, and these sorts of hedging statements by Alcibiades are one of his good attributes that Socrates recognizes 
you know, later on Alcibiades will put certain things in hypothetical terms in order that he won't be caught by the argument and then stuck in his position because, well, I was just kind of offering those as, you know, uh, posited uh, statements or hypotheses to build off of, and I'm not necessarily committing to them. Yeah, proceed my good man and I will listen. So the word good is used there. Uh, Socrates in acting as the kind of surrogate daimon here um, is leading Alcibiades back to the good. He recognizes even subconsciously, intuitively, the goodness in Socrates. Okay, uh, and that's an example of, in my translation, he doesn't say my good man, so you have to be careful about these translations. Sometimes important points are actually dropped. So Socrates, I will proceed, and although no lover likes to speak with one who has no feeling of love in him, I will make an effort and tell you what I mean. So in the other translation, he says, uh, although no one who plays the part of the lover likes to speak with someone who has no feeling of love back. So here it's just saying no lover. I don't know in the Greek, I wish Damien was here, he could clarify for us whether that on the part of the lover is just an embellishment of my translator or what that is. Um, but it makes a difference because if Socrates is saying playing the part of the lover, then Socrates is not committing to filling that role um, kind of in fact, he can play at the role of the lover in service of, you know, really more of a teacher advisor, um, not someone who's giving into love and being dominated by love exclusively or primarily. You know, Socrates is probably not primarily motivated by love, although love is um, a contributing factor in motivating Socrates' behavior here. Um, and then here, when he says, I will make an effort and tell you what I mean, there is where in the translation of the commentary by Olympiodorus, he says, I will dare. And that's where he says that daring uh, is a name given by Pythagoreans to the dyad, the indefinite dyad. So in this, Socrates is descending from his station down into the world um, to unite the multiplicity, and that is an act of daring. Um, and the, the dyad was it itself, I, I suppose, according to this commentary, called daring. So just a yeah, point that's uh, lost there. The Hutchinson translation mm -hmm. and the Cooper uh, he, he says, I must summon up my courage and say what's on my mind. So that seems like a similar, right. similar meaning. Okay. My love, Alcibiades, which I hardly like to confess, would long ago have passed away, as I flatter myself, if I saw you loving your good things or thinking that you ought to pass life in the enjoyment of them. Uh, so if I thought that you were content with all of these advantages that you see in yourself, I would have abandoned you because that's... You know, he's saying the things that you think are good about you are not sufficient for me. I, what I see in you is the potential for more. But I shall reveal other thoughts of yours, which you keep to yourself, whereby you will know. Okay, so rhetorically here, he's kind of playing the prophet and then shortly after invokes the name of uh, a deity. Uh, whereby you will know that I have always had my eye on you. So you'll know that I've been providentially attending you. You'll recognize me as the kind of proper guardian over you. Suppose that at this moment, some God came to you and said, uh, so reasons offered, why does he invoke the name of the God? A, he likes being theatrical, and that was common. The deus ex machina uh, was a common device in Greek tragedy. And also, um, you know, the gods see everything that we do. And so when he says, if a god came to you and said, he encourages Alcibiades to like, be careful what you say in response to this, because, or what you think even in response to this, because the gods know your inmost thoughts, just as, you know, I do here, because he's, uh, Socrates is kind of filling the role of the divine for Alcibiades. Alcibiades, the god says, will you live as you are or die in an instant if you were forbidden to make any further acquisition? I verily believe that you would choose death. And I will tell you the hope, um, which also means he kind of, he believes that Alcibiades sees the body as an inhibition to his ultimate um, aim or his ultimate good. You know, it's very implicit, but if you're not happy with remaining where you are and you think that death would be preferable, then letting go of the body is a way of unleashing, you know, whatever that ultimate being is that you're after, even if 
Alcibiades might not believe in the immortality of the soul yet. There is, you know, in our being the the logoi of these facts of our immortality and, and etc. Um, and I will tell you the hope in which you are at present living. Before and he also answers for Alcibiades in this. Um, uh, Olympiodorus says because um, he, you know, Alcibiades is too far from the gods currently to uh, directly communicate with them, even hypothetically. And so Socrates being closer to them answers on the part, on the behalf of Alcibiades. So once again, Socrates acting as a mediator here. And I will tell you the hope in which you are at present living. Before many days have elapsed, do you think that you will come before the Athenian assembly and will prove to them that you are more worthy of honor than Pericles or any other man that ever lived? Um, so, you know, the context here is that Alcibiades has just turned either 18 or 20 different uh, people that I've read give different numbers here. But there was a kind of ritual, like rite of passage you would end your uh, education in gymnastics, uh, music, and grammar, and begin your military education at age 18 or 20 in Athens. So Alcibiades is just about to go through this uh, rite of passage. He's gonna be given political rights. He will now have the ability to go before the assembly and speak. And of course, uh, you know, Alcibiades is wholly intent on doing so because he has overwhelmed all of these suitors. He's overwhelmed all of his peers growing up. He's the tallest person around. He's the most handsome around. He's the best spoken, is the best at reasoning uh, among like his, his peers. And he is under the impression that I'm just gonna go and talk to the, the assembly and they're gonna think that I'm you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread, etc. So this, uh, this proposition that Socrates just made, uh, this choice, is uh, similar to uh, what was offered to Achilles in the Iliad. Uh, whether to die young is, is uh, world famous or to uh, live a long life uh, mm, without okay. fame. Yeah, so a nice literary reference there. And having proved this, you will have the greatest power in the state. When you have gained the greatest power among us, you will go on to other Hellenic states, and not only to Hellenes, but to all the barbarians who inhabit the same continent with us, Europe. And if the god were then to say to you again, here in Europe is to be your seat of empire, and you must not cross over into Asia or meddle with Asiatic affairs, I do not believe that you would choose to live upon these terms. But the world, as I may say, must be filled with your power and name, no man, less than Cyrus and Xerxes is of any account with you. But there's two sides to that. One is like, okay, Alcibiades is way over the top in his estimation of himself. Uh, he has unrealistic expectations, um, but there's also a kind of virtue in that, this unbounded ambition, this thought that you can be like a god uh, is at some level a desire to return to more divine natures, right? And that is what Socrates wants for Alcibiades. Um, the kind of philosophical life and finding your way to uh, theurgic practices and, you know, being initiated in mysteries and all of that good stuff. Um, right. But uh, Alcibiades obviously is in a kind of corrupted state because he has this desire to emulate God, but doesn't know how to do it and interprets it in a material vein. Such I know to be your hopes. I am not guessing only, and very likely you who know that I'm speaking the truth will reply, well, Socrates, but what have my hopes to do with the explanation which you promised of your unwillingness to leave me? And that is what I am now going to tell you, sweet son of Cleinias and Dinomache. So once again, invoking the names of his parents, the families that he's a part of, um, that familial connection uh, endears him to Socrates as well. Um, just as the God, um, God, gods bring men together. That's one thing from the, I think it was called Elysius. Anyway, one of the dialogues where these two boys are talking about friendship. The conclusion is that one of the Lysus. conclusions, yeah, Lysis, um, is that the gods bring men together. And so all union comes from above, right? The, the highest thing is the one. All union happens through a participation in the one. 
And so all forms of bringing together friendship, love, ultimately emanate from uh, the gods. So family uh, is an idea of union, an idea of love. God is an idea of union, an idea of love. There's constant like reinforcings and reverberations and themes being like treated at different ontological levels to give this organic coherence and unity uh, to the dialogues. The explanation is that all these designs of yours cannot be accomplished by you without my help. So great is the power which I believe myself to have over you and your concerns. Uh, and this I conceive to be the reason why the God has hitherto forbidden me to converse with you. And I have long been expecting his permission. So when he knows Alcibiades' ambitions, he knows that he holds the key for Alcibiades to accomplish them. And only when Alcibiades comes of age, only when the, the appropriate time comes, does the god allow Socrates to exert his influence. For as you hope to prove your own great value to the state, and having proved it to attain at once to absolute power, so do I indulge a hope that I shall be the supreme power over you, if I am able to prove my own great value to you and to show you that neither guardian nor kinsman nor anyone is able to deliver into your hands the power which you desire, but I only, God being my helper. Now it's interesting, like Socrates is put in the role of the instrumental cause of the gods here, acting as a messenger of the gods. Uh, but here, this translation makes it seem like God is the helper of Socrates. I think it's the other way around. When you were young, compare some uh, symposium, and your hopes were not yet matured, I should have wasted my time. And therefore, as I conceive, the time wasn't right. God acts providentially at the opportune moment. The God uh, forbade me to converse with you, but now having his permission, I will speak. For now, you will listen to me. Alcibiades, your silent Socrates was always a surprise to me. I never could understand why you followed me about, and now that you have begun to speak again, I am still more amazed. Whether I think all this or not is a matter about which you seem to have already made up your mind, and therefore my denial will have no effect on you. But granting, if I must, that you have per uh, perfectly divined my purposes, why is your assistance necessary to the attainment of them? Can you tell me why? All right, so he obviously wants to know that uh, these are the kind of positive philosophical qualities that Alcibiades possesses by nature. That's why he is deserving of love. He is like an admirable character in a lot of ways, even if flawed. Um, also, I mean, it's just kind of amusing, like, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe you're right. If I, if you were right, uh, how would that work? You know, it's kind of a funny position to be in. Um, you want to know whether I can make a long speech, such as you are in the habit of hearing, but that is not my way. I think, however, that I can prove to you the truth of what I'm saying if you will grant me one little favor. So asking the least uh, moving, and this is scientific knowledge in general as conceived in uh, Plato, right? Moving from the simplest uh, hypotheses, you know, asking for the least concession and then building the whole complex argument out of that, from the one to the many. Alcibiades, yes, yes, if the favor which you mean is not a troublesome one, will you be troubled at having questions to answer? Not at all. Then please, uh, then please to answer. Ask me. Have you not the intention which I attribute to you? Um, so he wants, Socrates often doesn't want to engage with people who are giving him hypothetical answers because he sees that this offers them a way out. He wants them to be convinced by their own uh, answers here. And later on, it's going to be argued that the answerer in a question answer pair is the one who is actually making claims. Even if the questions are much longer, the answer is what is the positive statement here? A question is never a proposition, right? A proposition is a, a statement of fact, a claim about the world, and only the answerer can do that. So he wants the answer to be sincere. I will grant you anything you like in the hope of hearing what more you have to say. Uh, so here it's, it's clear uh, that Alcibiades is still not committing to telling what he really thinks. You know, an attitude of a kind of timocratic, strategic man, um, you know, aware that he might be getting himself into trouble at some level. You do, and 
uh, you know, that might explain some of Alcibiades' success in warfare. You know, he's exhibited intuitions, in, intuiting Socrates' um, wisdom in a certain way, his goodness, even if like subconsciously, um, ex, you know, falling in line with this synchronicity where they both were ready to approach each other at the same opportune moment. Alcibiades is often just at the right, in Plutarch's biography of him, is often at just the right place at the right time. And things just work out for him that way, uh, channeling kind of uh, divine energies in that rather than being this kind of calculating, rational, strategic general. There's something super rational um, in Alcibiades' conduct and also in Plato's philosophy, right? Plato is not a rationalist. He does seem to be a mystic in many ways. He kind of completes the rationalist system and then goes beyond it. Uh, you do then mean, as I was saying, to come forward in a little while in the character of an advisor to the Athenians. And suppose that when you are ascending to the bema, I guess the pulpit kind of thing, I pull you by the sleeve and say, Alcibiades, you are getting up to advise the Athenians. How do you know the, ma the matter about which they are going to deliberate better than they? How would you answer? So here is where like the real meat and potatoes, the discussion, like Socrates' demonstration begins. Um, so at this point, then, like, why do you think this is the way Socrates really digs into it? Why is this our starting point? Why these questions? Why this little scene? Like, what's think rhetorically? Think in terms of, you know, wh what is uh, in the argument? What is the point that he's beginning to drive at? Um, so what's what's Socrates' motives here in beginning the questioning this way? So this is where he identifies uh, the, the claim to knowledge that he doesn't really have. Right. At, at that level, he expo he's asking the question like, OK, you want to advise the Athenians, but about what? What do you know better than they do? Do you know the matter about which they are going to deliberate better than they? So he's asking, like, why are you advising the Athenians? And this is something that Alcibiades hasn't really thought through. He's operated so far on like his good looks and a smile, uh, right? Kind of skated through life. And now he has to think about like, okay, what exactly are they deliberating on? And what do I have to contribute to this? And this is where we get into the whole chain of you know, specifying what kind of knowledge he's bringing to the table and how he gained it. Um, which opens up general questions of epistemology and so forth. Uh, but another reason why this little image is to put Alcibiades visually in his mind, kind of forcing him into the position of being there, about to speak to them. And then in that position, once he's there in his mind, in the right setting at the right time, then uh, reveal this difficulty so that he feels not only like anxious to address the question that Socrates is an asking, but putting him like, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds before he's going up on the podium, all of a sudden realizing like, oh, what is it that I, I, I know better than them? And what do I have to tell them that would be helpful for them? So really an effective rhetorical strategy, you know, putting yourself in the hot seat or putting your uh, interlocutor in the hot seat in their mind in order to make clear uh, the the like force of the objection. Okay. Um, and also, Pieties, I should reply that I was going to advise them about a matter which I do know better than they. So, like, yes, I do know better than them what they're going to talk about. Uh, just intuiting, like, of course I know better than them. I'm I'm usually the smartest guy in the room. Socrates, then you are a good advisor about the things which you know? Certainly. And do you know anything but what you have learned of others or found out of yourself, uh, or out yourself? That is all. So either, so this is an important thing, right? So one small question, he gets this dichotomy. Either you learn from others or you find out for yourself, right? What other way is there of acquiring knowledge? Um, of course, the kind of implicit third option in Platonism is that you already know it, but you already know it in a subconscious way. You already have it according to being. All knowledge is there in you according to being. That's the Platonic doctrine, right? Our souls are immortal. We've already experienced everything through infinite time. And 
uh, we have to awaken and recollect that knowledge, those logoi, into our mind um, through this process of questioning ourselves, knowing ourselves. Um, but and so you know, Alcibiades doesn't think of that. He's saying you learn from others or you find out yourself. That's how you acquire knowledge. Uh, there's and here uh, the commentators offer a division of worth here. So when you find out for yourself, that is surer knowledge than when you are given knowledge by someone else. It's better for you to ask the questions for yourself and find out for yourself, even with the help of someone else who is helping you ask questions. Right? That's the superiority of the Mayudic method, midwifery, where you give birth yourself, but someone else helps facilitate the birthing process to an idea. Um, so that is superior to learning from a teacher, but learning from a higher being, receiving knowledge, inspired divine knowledge, the commentators say, is better even than finding out for yourself by question and answer. You know, that's why in, in certain moments, Socrates slips out of the question and answer and firm demonstration and goes into this kind of mythopoetic mode of exposition in for truths that just are at, at too high of a level and can only be received kind of by revelation. So there's a twofold learning from others, learning for others at your own level, like a human teacher or learning from the gods. When you learn from the gods, that's superior. So I don't know if that's true to Plato. I think there are hints that that is a Platonic perspective, but um, certainly the Neoplatonists thought so. Socrates, and would you have ever learned or discovered anything if you had not been willing either to learn of others or to examine yourself? So the further point uh, that in order to learn of others or to find it out for yourself, you would have to be willing uh, to do so. And Alcibiades agrees. So here we're getting him to examine the reasons why he would have the knowledge that he has. So there we get the method of learning, the direct cause, the efficient cause of learning, either you were taught or you investigated. And then we have the uh, final cause, the telos of learning. So you'd have to have the will to do so. And, uh, and would you have been willing to learn or to examine what you supposed that you knew? Certainly not. So that's the twofold ignorance. That's the danger of twofold ignorance, assuming you know something that you actually don't. We all fall into it. It's kind of a default state because, as I said, we have those archetypes of the forms in us uh, by nature. And so we feel like we know them because they're there in us, in our mind at some level, but they're not accessible to reason. They're not accessible um, to intellectual intuition off the bat. Uh, and that's another kind of psychology point of Platonism. There are different faculties of knowledge, right? The highest faculty is intellect. And intellect is the hypostasis or level of being above soul, right? So soul at its peak makes contact with intellect. And so intellect, which is a higher order of being than soul, makes its appearance at the summit of soul. Uh, just as existence or hyparxis is at the summit of intellectual essences. And so at the summit of intellects, you reach the influence of the henads. So these orders connect at their, their peaks. Um, so anyway, but uh, we, the faculties are intellect as the highest in our soul, and then dianoia, which is like discursive reason. So reasoning in dialectical methods, that is dianoia that elevates us and prepares us to be able to then intuit with intellect. The intellect is an intuitive function. It's not like, you know, intellect isn't reasoning process. Intellect is an intuitive apprehension of the forms. Um, and then dianoia is this dialectical discursive method. And then beneath that, there's perception and imagination. And dianoia and imagination work together in mathematics in order to then like prepare us for the sure apprehension of eternal true beings, which are the forms. Uh, Socrates, then there was a time when you thought that you did not know what you are now supposed to know. 
So the conclusion from that chain of arguments was, okay, if you say that you know better than them this thing, then you must have learned it or found it out for yourself and you must have the will had you must have had the will to do so and so you must have thought that you didn't know it at some point, which you know all follows. Sosbiades agrees. Uh, Socrates, I think that I know tolerably well the extent of your requirements, and you must tell me if I forget any of them. According to my recollection, you learned the arts of writing, of playing on the lyre, and of wrestling. The flute you never would learn. This is the sum of your accomplishments, unless there were some which you acquired in secret, and I think that secrecy was hardly possible and you could not have come out of your door either by day or night without me seeing you. So, um, once again, like, the, the idea that Socrates is, like, ever vigilant, seeing everything, he's kind of the archetype of the all-knowing uh, father figure, daimonical figure that's, you know, aware of all your goings-on. Um, so why, <laughs> this is actually a question that's been commented on, extensively uh, in different authors, why Alcibiades didn't want to learn the flute. Um, I believe in the biography of Plato of Olympiodorus, Plato himself didn't want to learn the flute. And the flute here is not like a modern Western flute. It's I think also called the Aeolus or something like that, which was a two piped reeded instrument you can see reenactments of uh the flute instrument they're talking about and it's quite the sound you know if you ever listen to like oboe english horn bassoon it's like that but much more like hot harsh nasal caustic loud uh brilliant sound um so it's you know not aesthetically pleasing to my ears either i can see why you wouldn't want to some people though say that alcibiades didn't want to learn it because it would contort his face um but proclus actually says that that is not the real reason the real reason is that noble youths in general in athens would not learn the flute because it's not appropriate for uh, that phase of life and learning, right? Ap Apollo is the god that is that we're kind of in the train of uh, in acquiring uh, learning through habitation. And Apollo is the god of stringed instruments. The stringed instruments evoke like mellower feelings that soothes us, calms us, makes us susceptible of education. And so it, the flute is actually not an appropriate instrument to learn, uh, according to Proclus. It, during that phase of life. However, uh, he does say that the flute, which excites to a greater degree, is an appropriate instrument for the mysteries. And as much of a rationalist as Proclus can seem to be, he was above all a, a practicing theurgist and mystic. Uh, so it's if when he says the, the flute is more appropriate for the mysteries, he's not saying it's like some, you know, uh, isolated instance when it's a useful thing. I mean, obviously that's a significant uh, purpose that the flute has. Uh, and the flute comes up like more than you would think in Plato. He's always using the example of someone uh, being a flute player and knowing how to play the flute and teaching the flute. Didn't learn the flute because it's not the appropriate instrument. So he had the right intuition that it wasn't appropriate. But maybe, you know, the direct thought in his mind was I don't want to contort my face and look ugly while playing that thing. Uh, Alcibiades, yes, that was the whole of my schooling. And are you going to get up in the Athenian assembly and give them advice about writing? No, indeed, or about the touch of the wire? Certainly not. They are not in the habit of deliberating about wrestling in the assembly, hardly. Then what are the deliberations in which you propose to advise them? Surely not about building. The builder would be uh, more knowledgeable than you, he will. Nor about divination, no. About that again, the diviner will advise better than you will. True. Whether he be little or great, good looking or ill looking, noble or ign uh, ignoble makes no difference. Right. So the point is like, it doesn't matter how high quality you are, potentially, what do you know that you can impart to them to make you a good advisor? That's the criteria. So he's like making that uh, clear to him, which is an important point to make. He inserts those sorts of things in the line of questioning as a statement. Um, just to kind of drive the point home in subtle ways, you'll see that inserting a point in in the middle of a chain of reasoning. Um, it's an important point. 
Uh, also, a, a, something to watch out for here, and I don't have a ready answer, but usually when there are several examples chosen in Plato, they're there for a reason. Uh, like it's not an arbitrary choice of which examples here to use, the builder, the diviner. Um, in fact, I, I would be surprised if Olympiodorus didn't comment something on this. Uh, I'm not gonna look for it now, but uh, are there any speculations? You know, why would Socrates choose these in particular? And these are essential elements of, of having a city. Mm -hmm. You need buildings and, uh, and uh, you know, ways of worshiping the gods. Right. Okay. So maybe one, one being like the foundation, uh, the bottom level, which is necessary, uh, building the stuff, and then the other, what to do with the city as a whole, uh, advice from on high is also a necessary thing. So we kind of had the, the peak and the bottom, perhaps, of the civic hierarchy. Um, also building, so obviously he mentions writing, the lyre playing, and wrestling, because those are the things that he learned. And he wants to spell those out just to drive home like, okay, what is the subject that you know better than them? And then building, maybe something that's just conspicuous that everyone knows um, at some level, right? Like everyone can kind of appreciate architecture. Not everyone can appreciate, you know, liar making or like some like subtler craft, but something that's out there in the open is obvious. Um, that also calls to mind, like Alcibiades has the pretense to be a statesman. And I think it's an easy job to have the pretense to. Like a lot of people have political aspirations or think that they know politics. They have like really strong political opinions because they like in their minds are pretending to the station of knowledge of the statesman. The statesman is a universal figure because he knows the proper good of each individual occupation. So the statesman does, isn't the builder himself, but knows what the builder is aiming at in their building. You know, like Pericles advising about building the walls uh, uh, around the port or whatever, or about building the naval fleet. He's not a shipbuilder, but he knows the good of naval vessels. And so, you know, uh, is kind of a more universal figure than many others. Whereas the common person has this common knowledge, like in a little bit, we'll talk about uh, being taught Greek from the people in general because it's common knowledge because they do have a kind of base level. Uh, so more common knowledge is symmetrical with the, the most kind of specialized knowledge in the state, which is the statesman, right? The philosopher king is the ultimate statesman that's the highest role in human society achievable and it requires all that specialized knowledge more than anything else to exercise well to perfect and yet the common person because they're dealing with the most general notions feels like they know it For the same reason i think that philosophy has such a bad rep reputation in general because it deals with highly universal concepts people think like i know what that's about i know what justice is you know they they feel like they have it so building and then divination um things that are commonplace everyone sees the religious rituals everyone sees the buildings conspicuous examples that are easy to come to mind and they represent a kind of polarity the highest thing and then the lowest thing the matter of the state the buildings what it's made out of and then the divine intention that is directing it Um, Socrates, about that again, the diviner will advise better than you will. True. Whether he be little, yeah, I already read that. Certainly not. A man is a good advisor about anything, not because he has riches, but because he has knowledge. Assuredly. Whether their counselor is rich or poor is not a matter which will make any difference to the Athenians when they are deliberating about the health of the citizens. They only require that he should be a physician. Of course then what will be the subject of deliberation about which you will be justified in getting up and advising them about their own concerns, Socrates? Um, so here is an answer uh, that reminds me of the answer in the Carmides when Socrates asks for a definition of temperance. And 
uh, Carmides, well, initially gives a poor answer and then he get, gets a second shot at it and he answers, uh, it's doing your own business, which also comes up in the Republic as the proper definition of justice, each part doing its own proper business. Um, so about doing their own concerns. Um, so the, uh, Alcibiades is intuiting a, a very general principle that comes up moments later. Doing your own business is one of those definitions that's offered in the Republic for justice. And what what is he going to say is their business? War and peace. And what is war and peace really about? Well, it's about justice. So here it's another instance of anticipation. Um, Alcibiades having a good intuition. And this often happens. Um, like... Uh, the interlocutor will give a response that Socrates could interpret favorably in his own uh, or Plato's own kind of overall worldview, but instead he interprets it in the least favorable way to point out that like the your approximation and your good intuition about the answer actually is not going to cut it. You have to be able to specify beyond the kind of sophism here about their own concerns. Socrates, even if it was with a good intuition... You mean about shipbuilding, for example, when the question is what sort of ships they ought to build? Uh, no, I should not advise them about that, I suppose, because you do not understand shipbuilding. Is that the reason? It is. Then about what concerns of theirs will you advise them? About war, Socrates, or about peace, or about any other concerns of the state? You mean when they deliberate with whom they ought to make peace, and with whom they ought to go to war, and in what ma manner? Yes, and they ought to go to war with those against whom it is better to go to war. Yes, and when it is better, certainly. And for as long a time as is better. Yes. So, I mean, Socrates just introducing dimensions of consideration of when this advice is appropriate. So it's not just about war and peace in general. It's about who to go to war uh, with when is the better time to go to war for how long for the duration what duration should we go to war so just kind of pointing him in more and more specific directions for thinking about this socrates <clears throat> but suppose the athenians uh to deliberate with whom they ought to close in wrestling and whom they should grasp by the hand would you or the master of gymnastics be a better advisor of that the master of gymnastics and can you tell me on what grounds the master of gymnastics would decide with whom they ought or ought not to close and when and how to take an instance would you not say that they should wrestle with those against whom it is best to wrestle yes and as much as is best sure uh, certainly so he's creating this common term uh when it is better to go to war or with whom it is best to wrestle um say and so on and so forth uh, with accompanying the lyre and song and dance, moving on. And as you speak of an excellent excellence or art in the best in, in wrestling, and of an excellence in playing the lyre, I wish you would tell me what this latter is. The excellence of wrestling I call gymnastic, and I want to know what you call the other. So this is a basic kind of teaching method, giving him the paradigm, an example, and asking him to create an image of it. You know, follow the example, uh, just kind of classic teaching here. I do not understand you. Then try to do as I do. For the answer which I gave is universally right. When I say right, I mean according to rule. Yes. And was not the art of which I spoke gymnastic? Certainly. And I call the excellence in of wrestling gymnastics. So it's best to wrestle which that what conduces to the art of gymnastics. You did, and I was right, and I think you were. Um, well now, for you should learn to argue prettily, let me ask you in return to tell me first, what is that art of, uh, of which playing and singing and stepping properly in the dance are parts? What is the name of the whole? I think that by this time, you must be able to tell. Okay, so he's not able to tell. Um, then let me put the matter in another way. What do you call the goddesses who are the patronesses of art? The muses, do you mean? Yes, I do. And what is the, so he's looking for the name. Uh, that is given. We're getting a little bit deep in uh, the text now. I think we should probably, uh, if we try to keep hammering in a way, uh, we're going to miss some stuff. So we should reset then for next time um, around this this question, and we should think about the points that are being made here. Um, just for an exercise, you know, what is 
the core point? What is the argument that's being made here? He's giving these examples. He's asking for this common notion of excellence in arts. What is the point that's being driven at? And uh, we can offer kind of a suggestion at it now, and then we'll think about it more from this point and on in the dialogue next time. But yeah, what is the point that's being made here? So he's uh, he's giving examples of things that Al Alcibiades has studied, wrestling and music. Uh, but here, Alcibiades is kind of hung up on on basic questions about them. And so we see the difficulty he's going to have if he's trying to address the Athenians in general. Yeah, but not just about the subjects in general, but about their proper excellence. This kind of general feature belonging to all the arts. Right. Okay. Um, so he's driving at, you can see it a little bit lower down in the text, but well then consider and try to explain what is the meaning of better in the matter of making peace and going to war. And this is the admission I'm thinking and I cannot tell. So he's tried to illustrate the general tendency in all of these arts, there is a doing it better and a doing it worse. And what do you call doing it better in each of these cases? So this is how he gets to the concept of justice. Like, what does it mean to go to war better? Uh, well, ultimately, it's going to be more justly. Um, uh, the alternative, so that's the kind of idealist political take here. And Alcibiades does reflect the realist political take uh, shortly after that, saying, well, you know, maybe it's not really about what is just. Maybe it's about what's advantageous. But then Socrates just kind of repeats the same argument um, back at him regarding the knowing of what is advantageous, how he learned it, and etc. cetera. Uh, so he, by this point, he has backed himself into a corner uh, because Socrates has just demonstrated like there is a universal principle at work here, the good of each particular art, and through your like inability to identify it, you've exposed that you don't know it. You've only been acting by a kind of general intuition about these specific arts and never kind of scientifically categorized their their natures and you, you aren't thinking about things um, in a clear enough way that's going to even allow you to identify the problem of what you know better what is it that you know better about war and peace uh, and what is it called what field of knowledge is it the art of the general or you know what is it that's why he's constantly Socrates is constantly bringing up you know is it the the proper business of the shipbuilder or is it the proper business of the captain you know in all the different dialogues trying to get people to identify, um, because people like to talk in like open rhetorical terms uh, about like what, what is proper in general, not proper for some specific thing. And then the general property of something being good, well, like that's getting back ultimately, always pointing us back to the question of the nature of goodness itself, which is the first principle in Platonism. And knowing the form of the good is the, the goal of all uh, beings. So he's driving us that way and exposing our ignorance here. Um, you know, for people who read the dialogues, sometimes it is exposing like, yeah, you know, I never really clarified that to myself. Um, how do you define better or worse in making war? And these all stack together in this kind of whole hierarchy of forms, the great chain of being to lead us back to the top. So this is the beginning of that process, and it begins with like mundane things and classifying them. The dialectical method in general is characterized by Plotinus as a moving from particulars up to the general. So a process of abstraction and dianoia, discursive reasoning, to subsume lower level phenomena within higher level uh, names and knowing the proper names and cutting up reality at the joints like a good butcher, not breaking bones. That's a platonic example there. Um, so this is the dialectical method that we're seeing the beginning of, starting from particulars, getting up to the higher level principles. And then the summit uh, that of that would be 
finally arriving at intellectual intuition once you're prepared by like understanding categorical thought even at the level of mathematics and more permanent essences than you know shipbuilders and uh you know uh wrestling coaches and things like that so you ascend to more general ultimately mathematical concepts and then things that are superior to dianoia intellectual intuition that's the goal of of dialectic but dialectic also subsumes within it arriving at those unhypothetical direct uh intuitions the premises in mathematics are all hypothetical right even euclid the axioms are hypotheses they don't they're not proved within the system itself axioms are never proven um, the only thing that can demonstrate the proof of an axiom is superior to reason superior to dianoia and that is intellect so you arrive at intellect through uh, the dialectical method and then from that position then you return back down uh, giving unhypothetical sure foundations for all of these specific areas that you addressed and classified on the way up this is what we're seeing here is the dialectical method and that's the goal um, it's to Im not only improve your ability to argue which Alcibiades clearly recognizes and wants um, that's why he kind of slips that in well now for you should learn to argue prettily let me ask you in return to tell me yeah so he slips that in you know that you should learn to argue well so not only that it's also kind of getting to these forms and intuiting them and knowing them uh, so different a lot of different degrees of knowledge here being considered but I think that's enough for today and if there's nothing else then it was good talking with you guys and uh, I hope you all have a good week